This is George Von Driska, and you're listening to the Builder Sessions. George, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, guys, for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, we were chatting a little before we started recording here, and I said it's always it takes me by surprise when people ask to hear what I have to say. So I'm so I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the ask. We are all open ears here. <laughs> yeah, we're all learners. Yeah, no kidding. So. George, just for those of us or those of our listeners who aren't familiar um, with yourself um, and what you do, um, share a little bit about yourself. Uh, you know, I, kind of a weird story, I guess. So you guys are both teachers. I was I went to college to be a tech ed teacher um, at a time when tech ed was still called industrial arts. Um, graduated with my teaching degree at, at a time when tech ed programs were closing. So it was really hard to find a teaching job. So um, one thing I did, I, rumor was there was going to be this great new program called uh, the technology of science or the science of technology. So it was going to be a mix of like um, physics and chemistry and tech ed. So oh, cool. you would talk in physics about an airplane wing, and then you would all go in the shop and build an airfoil. So I went back to college and I got another degree in um, physics and chemistry so that I could teach the science aspect and the tech ed aspect. Um, and that program never went anywhere. So I ended up with another degree, but that's, I'm oh, way wow. diverging here. So, um, so in the end, I got hired um, at a couple different teaching places. Um, one of the big influence really was when I was hired by Shopsmith back when they still had retail stores, they also had schools in the stores. So I got hired to run a school in St. Paul, Minnesota. And um, that was really the start of my adult ed program. Eventually the Shopsmith stores closed. Um, but at that point I had developed a bunch of curriculum that I had at my fingertips. So I took that to the woodworking shows, to Rockler, to Woodcraft, basically anybody who would have me, I would offer my services to teach. Um, I was teaching in a Woodcraft store and there was a guy looking through the window into the classroom for a really long time and it later turned out he was scouting video talent um, for the north american outdoor group which was handy magazine um, he couldn't find any talent so he used me instead and i did um <laughs> come on <laughs> I, did three, I did three woodworking videos for them in about 99 and then um the company i work with now tn marketing which owns Whitaker's Guild of America. Um, they wanted to do Whitaker's videos in about 2007. And a guy who worked for them previously had worked for North American Outdoor Group and said, well, in like 99, we use this guy in Wisconsin, maybe he's still available. So they found me and we talked. And um, so in 2007, the idea was to shoot about 50 Whitaker's DVDs um and then be done that was going to be the end of it um we did about 125 woodworking dvds and then turned it all into a streaming platform online so oh, cool um where it was going to kind of be not you know not one and done but kind of relatively speaking one and done with woodworkers Guild of america um that that's still my primary thing today is i manage all the content on there we do have other people come in for videos um Char Miller King was just here. Jimmy DeResta was just here. We use outside people for videos whenever we can, but um, I'm the primary video person. And like I said, I manage all the content that goes on the site. And then outside of that, I teach whenever I can. I teach in my shop here in Western Wisconsin um, when stuff is more normal pre-COVID. Yeah. I'm typically on the road teaching about once a month. Oh, cool. Um, that could be a retail store, a woodworking club, um, kind of whoever will have me the uh, maker camp up in the Catskills. I'll be there again. That'll be my third time there. Um, so yeah, it's a bunch of different stuff makes up my year, the video shoots, writing. Um, I've got two books I did. Um, some very cool teaching gigs. I taught um, for Northwest Airlines before it was Delta, um, which was very interesting to teach woodworking to an airline company. Um, I taught in the <laughs> Pentagon um, in one week stints, about every six weeks for about two years, I was teaching woodworking in the Pentagon. Um, wow. So yeah, just a lot of cool Holy Peace Corps. I lives in Africa for about three years with Peace Corps. Um, so yeah, a lot of weird stuff woven in and out of the big story. Were you around the trades or building when you were younger? You mentioned you went 
like kind of your schooling and stuff, but like at a younger age, were you a hands-on person? Did you build lots? Like what about before, like kind of middle school, high school, were you around yeah, builders? And so stuff? I would say before, we, before we use the word maker in our standard parlance, I guess I was a maker as a kid, you know, like I, I was putzing with stuff all the time. And I think part of this, so there's two things. I think part of it was whatever's in our genes that makes us want to do that. Um, and I, I have just a lot of natural curiosity. I wonder if, um, yeah. so part of that as a kid was when we had a lawnmower that we weren't using to mow lawns anymore and we had a baby buggy and this isn't like in the, like, the baby strollers we think of today. This was a baby buggy that like the wheelbase was four feet long and three <laughs> feet wide. This like, was a huge thing. It was a Cadillac. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, so I, I remember building a wooden frame and putting the axles on there and then the lawnmower engine on the back, you know, trying oh, to build wow. a go-kart yeah. is what I was doing at, I don't know. I, I'm not sure I was 10 at the time, 10 or 11. I don't know. Um, and then I think the other function in there is my dad died when I was real young, four sisters. Um, so I think just there was a lot in the household of um, the girls are washing the dishes. George, can you fix this broken thing? Um, and that was whatever that was. And I would putz with it and see if I could fix it. And um, later I was in Boy Scouts, very active in Boy Scouts with a great troop. Um, and I think that was also part of it is all that bushcraft, um, and, and everything that we did with scouts was a big part of it. But yeah, I was, I, I was extremely lucky in that, um, I was already in, invested or interested in this idea of doing stuff with my hands. I had a shop in my mom's garage before I was even in high school, I had a shop. I'd been given a scroll saw first, and then, uh, I got a lathe, a wood lathe. Uh, which is still one of my favorite tools to work with. Not that lathe, but um, <laughs> turning. Yeah. And then a, uh, a WEN router. Um, so those are the first three major power tools I remember. But anyway, I set up in half my mom's garage. I set up a shop um, when I was in about eighth grade. This was in Chicago. I bought a wood burner um, so that I could keep the shop warm in the wintertime. Um so I was out there doing that stuff all the time. And, and I had a really good middle school tech ed teacher. And I just, I love this guy, Bill Mathis. And I decided when I was in sixth or seventh grade, I want to be a shop teacher, just like Mr. Mathis. And, and I, and I flat out said to him, how'd you get here? How'd, how do, what do I need to do to do this? And he said, well, I, you know, I worked in the trades. I went to college at university of Wisconsin stout. I took every woodworking class I could take. I, so that was it. That was my template. And uh, I went to the same college he had gone to. That's where I got my tech ed degree from. And I took, just like he said, I, I, we had a great shop program in high school that, that covered all of automotive, drafting, woodworking, building construction, plastics, metals. Um, I took every one of those classes and then went to school to be a tech ed teacher. Yeah. So it's just like, when somebody's like, when my children say to me, I don't know what I want to do when I'm done with college and they're all past that now, but like, I, I don't know. I can't relate to that conversation, man. Cause I was like, I had blinders on and I was focused on, I mean, primarily woodworking, but working with my hands since forever. Yeah. And, and I, I, my, my very first job was pumping gas. But then that was also spinning a wrench. Like when you, you know, that was, this was 69 cents a gallon was the price of gas. And um, when you weren't pumping, filling somebody's tank, because there was no self-serve, you were changing oil on somebody's car. So I was also spinning a wrench mm -hmm. at that place. And then my second job was a lumber yard. And um, I was stacking lumber, but also learning about material and the difference between dug fir and pine and, and all that stuff. And then uh, I put myself through college work in building construction. So with my tech ed degree, I ended up with a vocational certification to teach building construction because I had enough hours for that. So yeah, it's just been like, I don't know, I've been putzing and, and highly distracted all my life by, <laughs> by just like seeing something that's cool. And I wonder if I can do that. And yeah. that's still today. I, 
I recently bought a forge in an anvil oh, to cool. see if I can do that. So that's awesome. Never stops. Yeah. So that you mentioned, my next question was going to be, was there anyone specific that inspired you to get, you know, on your journey? Um, and it sounds like that teacher was pretty, pretty, um, inspirational in your journey. And uh, is there, is there anyone else that you, that you could name to say like, okay, well, this was, this person was a cool mentor in this area or whether it's career or a specific skill set. Is there anyone else that, um, really helped inspire you to go? Yeah, there's, there's a guy that my dad, my dad was a chemical engineer at General Mills, died very young, died at 40. Um, he had a friend at General Mills, but the friend was in Minneapolis. So another George, my dad was George. And of course I am. And his friend was George. So just to confuse the picture, um, <laughs> but George Johnson from Minneapolis, um, what started as him asking my mom, like, am, am I, is George and Boy Scouts, what is the troop doing? And my Chicago Boy Scout troop was very inactive. They did not do a lot of stuff. George was a scout master of a Minneapolis troop that was extremely active. So that led to um, spending um, pretty much all of my summers from an early age, I spent in Minneapolis, oh, not in okay. Chicago, because I'd come up here to do stuff with George's troop. He was a crazy good carver, whittler. Um, he did some woodworking. He did a lot of home improvement. So, you know, the, the Boy Scout influence, which came from George having such a crazy active scout troop, plus the things that he did. He tried to teach me to carve, which did not work for these hands. Um, but yeah, he was he was huge as well in the whole woodworking, doing, fixing side of stuff. He was not one to uh, he was not he had a he had a Volkswagen Beetle was his car, and uh, he was not one to call a mechanic on that car. He would he'd try to fix it himself, and I'd be ten years old laying in his driveway under the car with him doing whatever he was doing. You know? And I and I'm going to add something to that and say for my. Uh, the old guy giving advice is, oh yeah, bring it on. When you have that person in your life, you need to, while they're still around, go and tell them what that influence was all about. And I, I'm very lucky. Bill Mathis died at a very young age of stomach cancer, and um, I'm I'm so like just dumb luck happy that when I was in Peace Corps in Africa, I wrote him a letter and said you're, you know, here's what's going on here. And this is like, a, I was teaching woodworking. This is a crazy cool experience. I love this. This is really neat. And part of the reason I'm here is because of the influence you had on me as a teacher. And by the time I was back from Africa, he had died. So oh, wow. I never had a chance to do that face to face, but I subsequently spoke to his wife and she remembered him getting the letter from me from Africa. So I, I think it's you, you know, and I know how it is. I teach a lot. And you throw all of this stuff out there and you're just hoping it's having a positive effect yeah, on something. Hoping something sticks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think for, I would say to people, if you've got somebody in your life that had that kind of immense positive influence on you, you will make that person feel incredibly good. If you go to them and say, this is the deal and thank you so much or whatever, whatever you're going to say. Those influences can be, there's been a lot of parallels with a lot of the guests on the show about starting out in middle school or high school and having an influential uh, tech ed or shop teacher. And when we're, when we're teaching, sometimes, like you said, you're throwing all this information out, hoping they're getting it, not sure how you connect with people. And then lots of times later in life, um, they, they kind of come back and then they start to say, Hey, you know what? I really enjoyed this. And at the time you're kind of like, Oh, are these, you know, are these students or, you know, yeah. college students, are they, getting this or they and a lot of times yeah i guess it's probably good to to mention that to people sooner than later because lots of times you're sitting there like oh i don't know about this or are they are the students or the kids understanding this or are they having fun and you know four or five years down the road you might hear from some and then okay and then you get those kind of stories that really make you feel good that they're like oh that kind of helped me through high school or college and you know it was the best class and we had fun and i learned a lot but you don't get that instant response sometimes and you're kind of like spinning your wheels yeah. of Am I doing this? Am I doing an okay yeah. job here? It's good to yeah. know, right? Yep. Yep. And not for not for ego purposes, but like or or at some sometimes you don't even know that you're making an impact. I remember 
I used to work at the same school as Corey, and I was teaching automotive and auto body at the time. And we had these these two kids. Uh, I mean, they were kind of rough around the edges, but they were fun. And you know, this this the crowd. I don't know. It's they're they're the kids that I connect with the most. And we were having a a, a no a, bre- a pancake breakfast we hosted in the shop, and the whole school came through, and we fed them pancakes and stuff. <clears throat> Pardon me. And we saw this. Uh, well, these kids, these two kids that were sitting, or these two kids I'm thinking about, they're sitting with us, just hanging out and chatting and. And uh, this other teacher comes up to me and says, like, how did you get them to, to do that? To do what? Oh, they're just so calm and they're respectful. And they're and like, what? Not like that in your class? And they're like, hell no, they're not like that in our class. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, and so I didn't even, well, Corey and I both, we didn't really realize the impact. Like, that's an impact. Like, they're, they're just kind of calm and relaxed they're in their element and they're helping serve food and they're doing all these things when they're you know little little shits in this other class yeah. and, the, and the teacher can't well i mean it's the obviously it's the subject matter too they're passionate about it and that type of thing um, but it's really interesting when you because you can go through a whole day or a whole school year and not seeing the potential impact that you're having on these kids and uh once we realized that that's that was kind of like the start for the show is um, hopefully we can inspire people to get out there and build something cool because we've kind of seen, and it's not on our own, it, like this isn't like us fluffing our egos or anything, but um, we've kind of seen the impact in our short careers of like five, six years. Uh, there's been some impacts in kids that have pursued these trades as a career or whatever it is, picked up a new skill, and um, just just from being exposed to it. Have you experienced a lot of that? Yeah, I think... It's, you know, so for me, I ended up primarily teaching adults in my career, but yeah, it's, it's been great when a lot of times years later, somebody will come back and maybe I haven't seen them in all that time. Um, and then they'll start talking about or show pictures on the phone of, I did this and this and this as a result of the cabinet making class I took from you in 1986. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> wow. That's what a, what a cool um, growth that they took on um, as a result of something they saw or heard or read from me a bunch of years ago. So yeah, yeah, it's neat. Um, when I'm teaching, when I have people in my shop, um, the coolest moment is, you know, I'm, there's a lot of hand holding the first little bit of a class and we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And then it gets to where they know what we're going to do and, and everybody is freewheeling on their own and taking charge of their own projects and moving forward and that is to stand back and watch that that is so rewarding that it got to where they're comfortable enough with the tools the shop what they're doing that they're on their own and the in the bigger picture of that is presumably um and then people come back coming back as the example of that they get in their own shop at home and then it, it exponentially increases from there so that's on a, on a little microscopic level, I'm watching that interaction and that growth happen while they're in the class. But then, yeah, when they come back later, you can imagine in their shop that um, they keep taking it forward, 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 and keep going with it, which is crazy cool. Kind of like a foundation. You're giving them kind of a baseline and then you're exponentially there, you know, whether, whether, whether they do it as a hobby or as a career. Like that's the, the nice thing. I think lots of people get confused with, social media sometimes there's always like the end product um, and it's more of the process working its way into there and you're giving them through your classes kind of a uh, baseline and a certain set of skill sets and then they can take those and jump with them and they can do different things not only just in with woodworking but you're teaching them how to operate in a shop and you know the the noises and sounds and blades and like they're kind it's kind of a dangerous environment when you, uh, you know, when you first get, whether it's a student in high school or an adult who's never done anything, there's a lot of safety that can, uh, or hazards that can come into play. So just being comfortable operating equipment and kind of building that skill set. Yeah. And I think when I was doing my teacher training, well, and clearly, I mean, that was a bunch of years ago, that was 40 years ago. Um, and I still remember this today. I, I one of the teaching instructors, not, a, not one of the shop teachers, but the guy who was teaching us how to teach said, um, it, it's really important to teach stuff conceptually, not like hair splitting to the, 
whatever the medium is you're working with. So his example of this was, if you can cut up plywood and build a cabinet, you can, with a little bit of change, cut up fabric and make a shirt, and you can cut up sheet metal and make duct work. And so this, this idea of looking at stuff conceptually, was that really resonated with me? And maybe because, because I do do a lot of different stuff, like I'm primarily into woodworking, but um, I, I am working on cars and I've got the forge and the anvil. And I was so like, so, um, and, and when DeResta was here, he said a similar thing that it's like that it, whether it's metal work or plastic work or plastic or woodwork, the idea is the same. Um, and, and it's a little funky with metal because like welding is additive. You're, you're building up, you're not reducing like you are in woodworking, but, but the idea for the most part is the same thing. And, it, and, it, and I've sewed my own clothes, which I'm about, I am I going to lose a corner off my man card for admitting this year, but no, uh, I've, I had a singer in college. I had a singer treadle sewing machine and I couldn't afford uh, camo gear so that, that I wanted to go bow hunt. And yeah. so I got fabric and a pattern and I stitched That's camo awesome. gear on my singer treadle sewing machine. But no, and, I, think, and you I get, think it's pretty... you, you get a corner on your, on your man card for that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, and I think it's because of that idea of, now, you know, don't look at this as this is the sheet of plywood you're cutting today try to look at the 500, 500,000 foot view of what you're doing. And then where, where does this roll into the rest of my life mm -hmm. and see what happens. And I think that's, that's kind of where the, you know, we get into this thought of um, like maker, right. And um, the maker spaces and the maker movement. And you were a maker since before maker was cool. And so I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this whole this whole maker movement and and how is it just like a fancy word for what people have been doing the whole time or has it has it um encouraged growth in certain areas what are your thoughts on the whole thing yeah no i i so i think so i you know i came out of the magazine industry i, I wrote for american woodworker for a long time and family handyman and i've done some stuff you know kind of all the usual suspects i've done some writing for and one of the one of the things people often gnash their teeth over in that industry is um, we're going to get to a point where we run out of woodworkers because they're looking for me as a customer. I'm 61 and they see that as this, our demographic is that person. And I, I always said, well, it's not the the upcoming people may not buy magazines because they're more interested in digital than print, but those people are still out there. You just got to find a way to reach them. And I think, um, today's growth in that arena, the maker arena, is an example of that where, unfortunately for me, because I couldn't land a tech ed job when I got out of school, tech ed programs waned. But um, the pendulum has swung back to where people have come to recognize, and it's the same with people I get in classes here, they've come to recognize that they can sit in front of a computer and they can do sales or tech or whatever their day job is. But they want to have that opportunity to do something that is more um, tangible, that they can see the results, they can be tactile with. And that's where woodworking, welding, plastics, knitting, sewing, whatever it is, that, that people who are more like your guy's age than my age um, have seen that they want to have that in their lives. And that's where um, that's where that's coming from. So I don't I think that. Yeah, you know, you look at um, whatever the Delta ads from 1950 of the guy and still his white shirt and tie running the radial arm saw in his shop after work, you know, so so people were always doing this stuff in their houses, but I think I think it did drop off. And then I think today. Um, like that maker camp that Catskill Mountain maker camp is a great example. I'm like the oldest guy there and everybody else is 40 or 30 and that's so crazy cool that it's this huge group of younger people that are interested enough in this to travel there to buy tickets to the event to pay for the lodging to they're very very wrapped up in it and so yeah i think part of that is just like i said the pendulum swinging back and people recognizing they need something they want something to do that's more than playing on a phone or whatever um 
yeah so it's i think it's a legitimate growth area that's that's very cool and i'm happy about that hands-on tangible i think that's the i I don't know with the younger generation um maybe being that 30 (laughs) 20 30 but it seems like like i agree with your that pendulum swing it seems like the the trades and the craftsmanship um there's a lot of people that want to get back into that whether it's knife building forging um we've been looking at that cat skill camp um we have had justin dietrich on before and he was a big fan of the cat skill maker camp and he heavily yeah. suggested us uh we should check that out and we've been kind of looking at how we could get down there and it we, just seems we like we were close am- to going but then <laughs> we've i've discovered my wife's do pregnant and due at the end of august so that i'd, I'd come back to a divorce paper on my <laughs> <laughs> but it just it seems like up in canada here we don't have a lot of those big maker camps where they bring in uh, a wide variety of different craftsmen. So it's interesting to see in down in the States and with some of your, your classes that you do, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity to bring in um, kind of a diverse field of makers. And uh, how do you, how do you enjoy working with, um, you just mentioned you have, you have a forge and anvil now. Do you enjoy being around a variety of different craftsmen, um, people that, you know, do a, a bunch of different um, type of work that maybe you don't necessarily do? Yeah, I, I think so. Part of it, I think, is my my personality is very squirrel, you know, like. Um, hey, me too. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm easily distracted, which can make it difficult when I have a deadline. But um, the fun part of that, um, Craig from the Barefoot Forge was, was hugely influential in and like three years ago and getting me to the point where I bought the forge and the anvil today, because I had done that kind of stuff in high school and college and then fallen away from it. And then we did it um, at maker camp and, and he started me on putting together a Damascus knife blank. Um, so yeah, I, I love seeing what other people are doing. And then a lot of times it ends up being, um, I want to try that too. And then I buy a forge. So um same with welding. Like, I mean, I was on a hobby farm for a while, so I had a stick welder and I was, I could kind of weld to a point where I could put implements back together if I needed to. Um, but I wasn't good at it, but it was something I wanted to grow in. So I bought a better welder and then I intentionally started just making, you know, satisfy needs for some of the stuff I needed here in my shop. I started welding that stuff myself instead of buying it. Um, and it's, I'm just intrigued by all those different processes. So yeah, it's, um, See that the epoxy arena is another one that was um, the CNC arena is another one that it's just like you see it for the first time and get a G whiz effect and are um, I'm as intimidated as anybody else about my first epoxy pour and my first run on the CNC determine I'm going to break the machine or whatever and um, but you learn it and off you go and start doing your own stuff. And now you're doing some of your classes are around CNC epoxy work, live edge slab. Like that's gotta be cool from when you started to doing the magazine, doing classes and how that, the evolution of new products and kind of the the in, I don't know, but like epoxy, like you're saying, I, I love doing that and it seems like you can do everything and it really gets the students involved when they can do whether a logo or something cool river embed something pine cones or flowers like it just seems like you can really personalize something and um that must be cool for you to kind of be learning all this stuff and then be able to teach it as well yeah and it's like um i don't know where i just oh i was teaching it i was teaching at the mark adams school and one of the things they had us do was show slides and of our work and then kind of talk about our history. So the first instructor went and had this very focused type of furniture that they had all these slides of it. And the second instructor went and same that I can't remember, like one was furniture, one might have been bowl turning, and here's all these bowls. And then I had my slides ready. And it's like there's a bowl and there's a table and there's a cedar strip canoe and there's a and I said, like, well, unlike these guys, I don't have an area of specialization. I kind of suck a little bit at everything, but I, I can put my hand to a lot of different stuff. And so, yeah, I end up, I like epoxy is an example of that is, um, Jess Crow was here doing video. I got excited about what she did and taught me. 
And then I started doing more of it. And then when I can, you know, see one, do one, teach one kind of approach, yep. um, I learn enough to where I'm comfortable to get that in front of people. And the epoxy stuff is a really, I really like that because it's so creative. It's not, um, it's not lineal at all. I mean, I basically never know what it's going to look like when it's done. And um, cause I'm not good at predicting the epoxy results. Uh, like, you know, when you're talking about putting colors together on the surface of a charcuterie board or something like that. Um, but I like that because when you build a cabinet, it's very predictable. It has to be this big. This table has to be this big. But the epoxy stuff, bowl turning is very just, uh, it's very organic. And it is fun to watch students do that too, where you give them the tools. And we typically do a test for on scrap. And then you give them the real piece and turn them loose. And uh, it's neat to see them play with color and put it together and how it comes out. And, and you can even incorporate that epoxy into bowl turning. And like it seems like it can just be an additive into everything. I've seen cabinet doors with live it. Like there's a, a bunch of companies that do a ton of stuff and it's not just charcuterie boards or, um, you know, the river, uh, yeah. live edge river tables. It, it can be added onto, you can start dipping or pouring the, the ocean onto charcuterie boards and bowl turning. And there's so many different things that the, where you start to see that kind of artistic side come out where yeah. you might not recognize in our case and some of the students like, well, I want to try this. Well, I don't know how it's going to turn out. And then boom, they're hooked on it and they're doing this stuff that I can't even figure out. And it's just that personalization <laughs> and that artistic style that I think is kind of shifting a little bit too, where you can be a bit more creative and it's not like a cabinet, like you were saying, where it's, it's square, it's this tall, it's this wide. And, um, you're allowed to kind of play around and have some fun. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like with the live edge stuff, it's cool because I think for years in woodworking, we, we were cutting around defects all the time. And I, and I never really was like, I'm a huge fan of having a knot in a bowl or a table or whatever it is that it's part of the tree. So it is what it is. Um, so today, again, another pendulum swing of um, I'm going to use this big slab and it's got bark on it and it's got live edges and it's got a crack or a knot or whatever it has. And that's part of the beauty of it is it's weird looking, but it's cool weird. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing because it makes, it makes everything more unique where it's like in this part of the country, 99% um, of houses are just trimmed with red oak trim. You know, and it's just like if I see another piece of baby poop brown red oak trim, I'm going <laughs> to kill myself. It's just it's so ubiquitous. It's a, and and uh, so it's neat to see the departure from that um, hickory cabinets were a great growth in that direction. It's can't you kind of can't get a piece of hickory that doesn't have a knot in it and, and or um aspen is another example or not aspen um oh it's going to come to me when we're done probably but anyway alder um yes. woods like alder and hickory that are so prone to having knots and stuff in them and people are okay with that and there's a kitchen full of alder cabinet doors that are all knotty and that's cool so yeah I, I, ex I exclusively use uh knotty alder in the shop just because it's a great price point and it's got cracks, knots, voids. And yeah. to me growing up, I, I, yeah, everybody used to cut around and working in a cabinet shop. Lots of times the customer wanted clean, you know, premium alder or maple, no knots. And you'd have to be cutting this stuff out and wasting a lot of this material where it just adds kind of character. And like you said, it's part of the tree. It's natural. And, um, I think there's, everybody's got, I mean, when it's a customer saying what they want, that's one thing, but when you're able to kind of build your own thing and incorporate those voids and cracks and knots, I, when you look at a table that, you know, has that stuff, it looks really cool and adds character to everything. Yeah. I'm going to do, I'm going to redo the cabinets in this office. There's kind of, there's a sink right over there. Um, and I'm going to do those cabinets in alder and I can't wait cause I love the wood. And I, and the stuff that's in here now are like the crappiest home center cabinets ever. Um, so I'm, I'm stupid excited about that project. And I, I have a little dorm fridge I'm looking at on top of the cabinet now, and I'm going to cut the cabinet smaller so I can fit a, a full size refrigerator in here, which will hold more gin. Oh, <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's your water. office. It's okay. <laughs> um, Gin's fine. So, Gin's awesome. yeah, there's, there, there will be lots of evolutions in that fix that are going to be really, really cool for the shop. 
That's cool. So when you're talking about creativity, um, and you said, you know, you can kind of with those certain projects, there are certain, um, there's there's freedom for them for your students or whoever it is um, to get creative. Have you come up against um, people who are not sure? I know for I'm just speaking from my experience with students. Um, when I let's say with a welding project, I have a couple of things that I want them to do to lay a foundation, but then their main project, I'm just I just say go, and some of them have trouble with that because some of them really want to be, and I know I'm we're working with younger ages, but I'm just wondering if it if it continues on into adulthood um, with what you've experienced. Um, people just these students, well, some of them just want to be given the directions. What do I do? And just no parameters because there's comfort in that, right? There's discomfort in, in freedom a lot of times for these students yeah. and creativity. Have you come up against that a lot? And, and, how do you, and how do you encourage these people to just like step out and be creative and take chances? Because there's that imposter syndrome too um, that they could probably, oh, I don't know this. I don't know. Well, I don't either, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so how do you, how, do you, uh, how do you approach that? Yeah, it happens where... Um you're right that people, they, they just, some people just want to be told what to do. Um, and then when, we, I don't know, I, I just, I guess I just quit answering questions. Like what, you know, a, a question that's going to start with, well, should I, should I, should I, and I, I, sure, maybe, I don't know if you want to, like, there's no right or wrong answer to this. And um, I think for me, it just gets to where once they realize I'm not going to participate in the discussion. Then <laughs> they, um, then they just they got to pick that direction and go. And um, and I recognize it's hard. You know, here in my classes, they're they're paying the tuition. They're maybe traveling from other parts in the country, so they're in a hotel. They're eating their meals in a restaurant. So this is an expensive get go that they're investing in. And and I want them to leave. Another great admonishment from one of my teacher education teachers was never let your students leave with crap. And his, his reason for that was because their parents taxes pay your salary. If you're going to be in the public school system, that, that was the drive behind that. But I also take that to heart that when these people go home, they want to show their spouse, their kids, their whomever, this stuff that they just spent time making. Um, so free wheel. Yes. But don't, you know, I'm, I may be watching from afar to prevent them from making some horrible, irreversible mistake that just isn't going to work. I don't know that I think it's a totally bad decision. But um, yeah, I think I think a lot of it is to just, uh, so, I don't know, I was going to say sort of empower, but I guess it is just flat out empower them to feel like it's going to be okay. And um, and some stuff, you know, if we're, if we're doing the cabinet and the cabinet making class, there are more materials. And if we mess that up, um, we can have another go. Um, back when I was doing guitar making classes, that's not the case. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. you can't freewheel quite as much because you're not going to run to the home center and get another mahogany neck. Um, so that's not as forgiving. But um, yeah, it's just, I think, just cut them loose as much as you can. And while watching... Yeah. to make sure that nothing really bad happens do you, do you find working with adults the it's, it seems again coming from a younger generation teaching the younger you know 14 to 18 year olds the notion around mistakes do you find sometimes the adults are afraid to try something because they're afraid that they're going to make a mistake or are they kind of able to work through that and just try it out and if they make a mistake then they kind of go from, you know, fix it yeah. or problem solve from there? What a great question. So I got to think a second. Um, I would say, yeah, there's a little, um, there's a little tentativeness sometimes because they don't want to screw something up. But um, part of that, I, you know, I've, I've been teaching classes like what I do today for a really long time for 40 years. So, uh, so at this point, I think part of what helps 
you know, maybe it's hard for me to answer that question because it doesn't happen too much because I've seen so much stuff go wrong in classes that I'm, I'm cutting it off at the pass three steps before that bad thing happens. So um, hopefully I'm giving them the groundwork early where by the time they get to the joint or the table saw, the band saw, um, I've, I've preempted the potential mistake by saying, so this could happen, but here's what you do. Um, so they they have the confidence going into it. But yeah, I think um, I find I find that with uh, men in my classes, they pretty much are just going to bull forward and go kind of no matter what. Um, women in my classes are way more prone to asking questions. Um, and it's not a knowledge based thing like both. They both have the same high level or low level skill set. Um, but women are way more willing to ask a question when they don't know what they're doing, where a guy is just going to bowl forward and, and, and pretend like he does know what he's doing. Um, so part of that helps the women end up having, I think, a better experience and a better result is because before they potentially make a mistake, they're, they're confirming, is this what I should do? And again, I don't want that to sound like a male, female knowledge set thing. Mm -hmm. It's a personality thing of willingness to expose yourself a little bit and say, I don't, I don't understand this next step. What, what am I supposed to do? And um, again, in my experience with people in my hands-on classes, that's women are way more prone to stopping at that point and asking before they move on. So I don't know. I wound off your question. No, a little no, bit. No. It's almost like they have a suspicion of, and we I see that in my classes too. They're more, um, uh, attention more attention to detail and just checking like hey this doesn't seem right am i doing this okay yeah where the boys in the class like you said they just bowl forward and oh well i guess this is uh this is built wrong but i'm just gonna be okay with it because i didn't yeah. worry about reading the plans or asking questions and it's kind of a fine <laughs> line right i mean it's it's hard to you want to have some of them you want to let build and sometimes you have to fix it at the very end but it's nice to try and catch some of that stuff throughout the process and it's also if they do make a mistake it's also a learning opportunity where yep. i think that that pendulum on that um is also moving a bit too where there's a lot to learn from mistakes i mean everybody makes mistakes um but what can you take from it and learn to prevent them and or limit those moving forward yeah and i i'm trying to watch like in the classes i do i'm trying to watch to where nothing unsafe is going to happen and nothing that's so irreversible that now we have whatever a cabinet that's kind of going to go on a burn pile instead of in a house mm -hmm. but that being said if it if it's going in a direction of a little mistake like well okay no i'm i you know yeah i see that coming but i'm going to let it ride because like you said there's there's going to be a learning experience that comes from that um and um or, or I'm catching them like, you know, I'm letting them, I can see them thinking, 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 thinking. And then I'm catching them like right before they do that thing and saying, so let's talk about this for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about what you were about to do for a second. Um, and, and so it's again, use that as a, as a teaching tool for it. So it, it is, um, you're right. Making mistakes is a hugely valuable learning opportunity. <laughs> that results in stuff going in the scrap bin sometimes that, <laughs> then hopefully get used for other things. But I got, I got a question about your, um, your experiences. So you mentioned how, and it's really inspiring to me because I struggled with this a lot. Um, I have a bunch of different life experiences. I worked in the automotive industry for a while. I worked with youth um, in like a youth group kind of capacity, youth pastor kind of capacity. And I've worked in like a hot rod shop um, and I've worked uh, in, you know, in business and in media and all these things. And, and I've picked up some skills, um, just kind of like that jack of all trades, master of none situation. And in, when Corey and I were first talking and we were hanging out and stuff, and I was like, wow, I don't have, cause Corey has his red seal. He's a journeyman car or a journeyman cabinet maker up here in Canada. And I don't have my welding ticket yet, but I'm going, I'm going for it now. But, um, I do have these different experiences and I was kind of getting down on myself you uh, were for that because <laughs> I kind not kind of, I was, it was like kind of, kind of imposter syndrome, kind of comparing myself to others, that type of thing. Um, but my question is, 
Cause, cause you shared how, okay, well I dabble a little bit in CNC and I dabble a little bit here with forging and I dabble and you don't, maybe you're just, maybe it's just my ego, but it seems like you're humble enough to, to be okay with not being the, you know, expert on every single one of these. Um, and you, it doesn't seem like you battle with that imposter syndrome. Like, Oh, I'm going to get found out if I'm not, you know, I'm teaching this stuff or I'm sharing this stuff, but I'm not an expert. How do you get through that mentally? Uh, well, at some point, and I can't, I was, as you're asking the question, I was trying to get a time frame on when I started saying this, but I don't know when that was. But I started saying, it, it, to, and in the woodworking world, honestly, I don't think I'm a great woodworker, but I think I'm a good teacher. Um, so I think like in the world of woodworking, welding, um, and I'll throw another example into this in a second, um, kind of my superpower is an ability to break skills down mm. and make them teachable. So I coached, I coached high school volleyball for a while. And it's not that I'm a great volleyball player, but, um, but I, but I did that at the high school and junior Olympic level for like five years. Oh, so, wow. cool. um, so I think that for me, I'm okay with it because it's just how my personality is, is, I like doing a lot of different stuff. And with, with Woodworkers Guild of America, it's Woodworkers Guild. So like the <laughs> yeah. company that owns that is not interested. Like, like if it were me, I don't know, my, maybe my, my YouTube channel might look like Duresta's where it's, it's rehab, it's doing cars and rehabbing a bandsaw and then doing some woodworking and then some leather work. Cause in my real life, that's what I'm doing. I just, I just bought a heavy duty sewing machine so I could stitch leather because I made my own quiver a couple of years ago and I hand saddle stitched the whole oh, 122 wow. stitches. Um, oh, smoke, and it so. Um, so, uh, so I bought a leather sewing machine. So, um, so I think it's just, it's okay in my head. And the, and the other example I was going to throw in is I've been at a, a boxing gym for two or three years now and not, and this is my first time doing it, but subsequently now I'm, helping train the new boxers that are coming in and, it, and it's because it's not because i'm a great boxer but it's because i can observe and i can break skills down to a more manageable level um to look at this stuff like microscopically and say so it's just that your feet are a little too close together um where and and so it's same that i think that idea just applies to like everything i do of of um from the teaching perspective but yeah, I think being, it's just who I am is that um, I like doing a lot of different stuff and I'm, and I'm not, I'm probably never going to build the Cremona serpentine drawer front Chippendale or whatever style furniture that is. I don't even know. Um, it's just not my bag or the, you know, the really fine uh, Holly inlay stripes that are going into whatever that type of furniture is, you know, it's just not my, that's not my thing but I can build a pretty fast and cool mission style piece. Then I'm okay with that. Yeah. And, and that's okay. And I'm going to weld legs for it. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you kind of drawn yeah. off your passion and your interests, right? Lots of times if, when you're doing stuff that you're not really necessarily into or interested in, you don't really give it your all where if you're doing stuff that you're comfortable and you're enjoying, it sounds like, whether it's forging, leather work, sewing, like, I don't know, it's something to be said about. It's almost kind of like a lifelong learning and you're always up for trying new things and trying to better yourself. And I think the, being able to have a big bag of skill sets spread across, you know, horizontally and having a big set of skill sets is good to have. And then, like you said, being able to break skill sets down into more teachable aspects. I sometimes struggle with that in my classes, but even with that, I'm like, okay, like, Let's break this down into some smaller pieces. When a student has a question on, hey, can I try this out? And I have no idea. I kind of freeze a bit and go to YouTube and start watching videos. But then just yeah. trying to having that mindset of breaking it down into more manageable chunks of material that somebody is going to hopefully understand yeah, is beneficial. Yeah. I don't know. And it's fun. Like, I'm glad I don't. I mean, I love my shot and I like woodworking. Um, but I also really like having all this other I, I cut leather. So in, in the world of mixing mediums, I cut leather on my CNC machine for the first time the other day. No way. Making a little pouch for a block plane. 
Um, so I had a drag knife on the CNC so I could draw it in V-carve and cut it on the on the CNC. And uh, that was crazy cool. That so is cool. It's just uh, another like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident the Donic drag knife can do this. Conceptually, I think this is going to work. So then I messed, you know, I got leather on Amazon and stuck it to the machine and off it went and it worked. So yeah, just so a lot sweet. of weird little stuff like that. How do you stick, le- how did you stick the leather to the- You can either tank? use um, spray adhesive. And if you do that smooth side down, cause then it's relatively easy to clean off the smooth side. So the first time I did it, I used tack adhesive and it wasn't it wasn't bad cleaning it up the second time i tried it i used masking tape to hold it down so the piece was uh the blank was 12 by 18 and i just masking taped the edges of it like very firmly Mm -hmm. um and there's not a lot of lateral cutting pressure from that drag knife so that that held fine you just have to be a little you have to experiment a little bit because there's a little bit of pressure from the drag knife so whatever it is you're cutting, so it could be leather or plastic or inlay material, wood inlay. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't want it to like stretch or or shift a little bit as you're cutting, or you're going to lose detail. Um, so the the spray adhesive on a flat spoil board is 100. It's it, yeah. it it will it will not move, and as long as you can have the opportunity to clean that off of the final product, you're it'll be fine. Now, do you take that draw knife right down to the spoil board? Like exact- you, you zero it. Um, you can't zero it with the touch plate. You zero it with the paper method, you know, okay. pulling the paper under the cutter. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, it's, it's cutting then. So your depth of cut that you put into the tool path is the thickness of your material. And it's just, it's kissing, right? You can't really see a mark on the spoil board when you're done mm-hmm. um so it's just kissing that surface just barely but yeah it's you need to um like my machines all have um um slats and then t-track in between so it's not a continuous surface for this you really want a continuous surface so i have a fake spoil board i put on top of my spoil board mm-hmm. and then you need to fly cut that because you're in bazillions of an inch for this to work or not you know to cut all the way through you're in really tiny parts of an inch yeah. Um, that leather was, um, 63 thousandths of an inch thick. So you got to fly cut that fake spoil board to make sure it's dead flat. And then you're ready to go. That's so cool. I just got a four by four CNC this year, uh, in the nice. school and I'm a leather would be a cool. That's so cool. Yeah. I don't know. Those, I feel like the, and probably for you getting into CNC, I feel like it's such a, You've got the not only how to run your machine, then you've got the software with uh, running VCarve Pro Vectric, which is yep. amazing. And I can do kind of the basics, but then to get that next step, there's so much different things you can cut, um, uh, like polycarbonate and etch things. And there's laser. I, you have the um, Axiom uh, CNC, correct? Well, because of the classes, so I've got an Axiom, two Shotbots, a Laguna, and a Next Wave. <laughs> Nice. That's awesome. I originally wanted and to get a, the and Ax- a shaper origin. Okay. And awesome. those things are, I've got one of those in the shop too. Yeah. Those axioms are nice because you can get the uh, rotary lathe or else the laser yeah. too, which I was kind of bummed I couldn't get. But there's so many, even that one machine, now you can bring in a whole different ton of different medium, oh, right? Yeah. yeah. When I did, uh, so I do CNC typically at Maker Camp at the Catskill thing. And when I went last year and it it's shop bot that I do that. I'm on their machine It's Shopbot sends me to that. Um, so I said to them, I think, especially with the younger crowd that comes to this, we need to do weird CNC stuff. So um, I engraved plexiglass, I cut aluminum, cut and engraved aluminum. Uh, I don't, oh, I think I took a drag knife, but it was like, I don't know if I even took a router bit. Like I, I, I was very intentionally looking to do weird stuff on the machine you can put um felt tips in um into the spindle and you can use the machine as a plotter and so where in your tool path you would change tools to get a different profile from the cut you change colors so um i've taken artwork that my middle kid has drawn five by seven scanned it blown it up to 16 by 24 and um and plotted that on the cnc and turned her sketches into huge 
artwork pieces that I can draw out with a felt tip on the CNC. That's wow. incre- That's amazing. It's this whole thinking outside the box, hey? Like, yeah. That's amazing. I know we have, I just got a four by four plasma CNC, ta- like a plasma table at, at our school. We fundraised for it. And um, giving the, even something as simple as um, Tinkercad, letting the kids just go with that and using their imagination and, and, and doing that. And then they can, I had a kid do like a tree of life thing or also create parts that they can then weld together. And, and they're like, Oh, do you think we can make this? And it's things I've never even, I've never even thought about before. It's like, okay, yeah, go do it. Let's, let's have fun, you know? And it's really, it's really refreshing to know George that you're, you're constantly just like thinking, Hey, maybe I could cut leather on this thing. Like, that's so cool. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Yeah. It's just, uh, well, yeah. I mean, it has its downsides because like I, I sometimes lack focus, like pretty much all the time lack focus, but, um, but the deadlines typically get met generally <laughs> most of the time, sometimes. And so it all kind of, I work a lot of hours a week and that makes it all balance out. Yeah. So, there you go. <laughs> so wrapping up here, uh, we kind of usually end the shows with a couple standard questions here. Um, what is some advice you have for somebody who wants to get started into um, the area of woodworking? Um, I would, so the, the online stuff is great. And clearly I'm, you know, I've got 80 billion online streaming instructional videos out there. However, look for a place where you can go take a class. Um, a lot of schools, Mark Adams, I mentioned that I'm at my school here, Rockler stores, Woodcraft stores, um, are good at offering classes. So one, um, look for a place where you can take a hands-on class because that's really going to shortcut people learning bad habits um, and, and getting started on a better foot. Additionally, look for a club or a guild in your mm-hmm. area um, because there's going to be a big knowledge base there that, again, will shortcut, short circuit you slogging and slogging, where can I buy better quality hardwood or whatever. 80 people in that group already know where you can get better quality hardware. Um, so I think, I think that's a big deal. And um, the hands-on classes and, and looking for a club. And then um, you got to practice. And it's, I, and I, I jump on people on this in my classes all the time. Like you can't, you, you, you wouldn't just get a guitar and then say, okay, I'm going to go play a gig because you got to learn to play the guitar and then you got to practice and then you're going to go play a gig. So, but with woodworking, we feel like I bought a dovetail jig. So now I'm cutting dovetails for this huge cabinet I'm making for my spouse for Christmas or whatever. Well, you got to like, just throw some secondary material in there first, cut a bunch of joints that may or may not work, get comfortable with it. So same, like sometimes you just got to go in your shop and putts and, um, and get the hang of doing whatever it is, running the table saw or cutting a specific joint. And then you hang that piece on the wall as an example of what you did wrong or did right. <laughs> and you use it as a learning tool for next time. But um, take the time, you know, find something you want to make because that will drive you to learn the skills to make it. But practice those skills before you're making the thing. Mm. I like it. Now, on with, with that advice... What about some specific skill sets that are important to develop getting into the woodworking? Uh, um, well, so I would say a good skill would be using SketchUp. I don't know. Does that count? Like, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah um, for sure. Yeah. I'm guilty for years, like for decades of my woodworking life. I would, I would picture a thing in my head, then I would build it in my head. So at idle moments, I'm thinking about, okay, I'm going to cut the dados and then I'm going to, um, and then I'd go in the shop and I'd make it. And mostly it would come out okay, but not always. Um, So for me, learning SketchUp was huge. I remember the first thing I did on there was a dresser I then did on video and I wanted the drawers to be graduated. So um, getting, figuring out that graduation, like, the old George would have just gone in the shop and cut a bunch of drawers and figured that's probably going to work. Um, SketchUp George draws all that in SketchUp, and then you can fluidly change it as many times as you want because you're not burning up material on the drawing. 
Um, so I think investing in learning to get something on paper before you're going to cut wood. Um, everybody's talking about the prices of material today. So this is probably even more important than it was in the past that you don't want to waste any material. Um, so I think that's good. Somehow, somehow learning how to get your thoughts on paper before you cut wood is going to force you to think through the process. Safety is huge. Um, you got to develop. That's not just a skill. It's an attitude about, um, I'm, I'm way better at following my intuition today than I used to be. And that's part of it is like, I, I legitimately work a lot, a lot of hours, but, um, knowing when to be done, like in the tooling side of my shop, as opposed to, okay, I, I'm, I'm getting stupid and tired, but I can still come in here and edit a video. Like I can pull that off, but I'm not going to run tools. Um, so that the safety attitude, the safety aspect to make sure you're going to be safe working in your shop. Um, and then, I don't know, can you develop the skill set of like 3D picturing? I, I don't know. Like, Oh yeah, I think so. If there's a way to do that, I would say work on that because that's, um, that ability to to see to get how something's going to look in three dimensions before you start working on it is huge. Does SketchUp have that ability to do three D? Yep, yeah. yep. And SketchUp will give you that, but still, I think just when you're, you know, there's a methodology to stuff, um, and and I think. Well, I guess some of that can come from classes like and this is the thing I see with see with students like, well, and with my kids. So my son worked for me and he's very lineal. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. My middle kid who was the artistic one. She worked for me and she's like one, seven, four, three, nine, eight. And we're probably still going to get to ten, but her path is way different. So trying to get a handle on that methodology of what makes sense in wood in a woodworking project to do first, um, which isn't always given. Like you get an, if you get an article, a plan in a magazine that might not have a sequence of events, it might only have a plan. So developing that logical sequence in your head of it makes the most sense and cabinet making it's easy for me. Um, I'm going to make the carcass first, then we're going to do the face frame. Then we're going to do the door. Then we're going to do the drawer. Because one leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next. But a rocking horse has the same challenges of what what's the sequence of events for that project. So developing that part of your brain, I think, is important to, to avoid mistakes and get where you want to go. And understanding that process can be tricky if you don't, like with the students that you teach and that we teach, they don't understand the whole process of how to go through and build a cabinet. Yeah. So that gets a bit tricky too, trying to navigate if you don't have those kind of foundational or baseline knowledge of how something goes together, then you really have to get creative on how to, you know, how is this going to go together before I start making miscuts and going through lumber that costs a fortune now, right? Yeah. Yep. So um, last question, um, top three starting out tools that you would recommend for somebody getting oh, into this gosh. trade? <laughs> a credit card with a really high limit. Yeah. That's the first one. That's perfect. That's a good one. Yeah. It's, it's hard. So for, again, for a really long time, I said, no one will argue with saying a table saw. However, today, um, you could argue that a track saw can do so much of what a table saw can do. So maybe to cast a wider net onto that as a category, something with which you can linearly straightly cut stuff. Um, so in a, in a space constraint, um, a track saw can work for that. Um, that Craig, shoot, what's it called? That system that Craig sells now. Uh, I'm like Festool's table. Um, well, I can't remember what it's called, but but that's a pretty cool system. But you need a way, besides a circ saw and a jigsaw, to repeatedly, consistently, accurately cut stuff to size. So table saw. Um, and then, you know, Tools number one through 10 change so much depending on what you're going to do. I, I love a bandsaw and my kids used the bandsaw learning woodworking long before they used a table saw for ripping um, because it's so much safer than a table saw. Um, so um, I would advocate a bandsaw. And then if you're forcing me to pick a third one, probably a router table, um, hugely versatile tool. You can, of course, take the router out of it and use it handheld. So you kind of get a two for one. Yeah. out of a router table 
you can joint on a router table. So if you don't have a jointer yet, you can do that work on your router table. And then there's all the decorative edge stuff and joinery stuff you can do on a router table. So um, that's my story and I'm sticking to it <laughs> until I change my mind. That was so. four because you had the credit card too. Oh, yeah, that's, that's the cool. best well, one. Yeah, I yeah, like yeah. that answer. <laughs> I want the credit card first so that I can go start buying stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Well, George, thank you. This has been amazing. This has been this. It's been an hour, and it's gone by fast. And I could just sit and listen to um, your wisdom all day. Like we, I really. <laughs> well, appreciate- thanks for using the word wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, there were so many words you could have put in there. Wow. So, well, you thank to, you for using. Wisdom. I learned at a young age to uh, to listen to my to my peers and to listen to the to the value that they have to share, and uh, and you have a ton of it, and and I'm sure that Bill and George be super proud of you of where you're at um, right now Thanks. and uh, and we really appreciate your time and and as we as we as we sign off here is there where can people find you and is there anything you'd like to promote um, that you have going on right now well um, so my website is vondriska woodworks.com and then Instagram is my most active social media place so um, Von Driska works. That's Instagram and Facebook. Um, but again, Instagram is the most uh, active of that in the, uh, in the world of doing stuff besides woodworking. Uh, maybe a year ago, I started an Instagram page. That's my name, George Von Driska three, cause I'm George Von Driska the third. And that one is motorcycle camping, photography, like all the other boxing, archery, all the other weird stuff I do. Um, so that's my other Instagram page. And I'm trying with that to like, not just here I am camping, but it's like yeah. camping with this backpacking stove that it, this is what's good and bad. So just like I'm teaching on the woodworking page, I'm trying to teach or provide buying advice on that other page. Um, and then a um, Woodworkers Guild of America, of course, is where WWGOA.com is where all my videos show up. And then my big thing, I'm uber proud of the Live Edge Slab book that published last November. Um, I did all the photography for that myself. Um, it was number one in its ca- in three different categories on Amazon for a bunch of months. It's It's been selling really, really well. So um, I wish if I could remember the exact title, I would say it. But um, hang on, it's sitting right here. <laughs> how, how crazy is that? Um, Woodworker's Guide to Live Edge Slabs. Oh, we're not video. I'm showing it to the computer. Yeah. Uh, Woodworker's Guide to Live Edge Slabs, available on Amazon and a lot of other booksellers. Um, so yeah, the book is the book was a crazy intensive project, but um, I'm very very happy with how it came out and how it's gone with the publishing. Day. That's cool. Well, we will uh, we'll link to all that in in the show notes of this episode, and uh, for all of our other episodes and show notes and social media links. Um, it'll be all linked in the show notes of this episode too. So George, once again, thank you so much for your time today. It was awesome. And we'll definitely need to have you on again because you're such a wealth of knowledge. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks to you guys for having me. I, I, I appreciate being asked. It was very fun. And you're right. It went by the hour went by yeah, crazy it went fast. By super fast. And yeah. thanks for everyone for listening. Thank you, Hoff. Thanks, Rosie. And we'll see you guys on the next one.